We're starting a new series today titled The Good Book. The title of the message in this series is called Made in the Image of God. Listen, what we're going to do this year is we're going to encourage you to read through the Bible this year. Can that be okay? And um, if you go to LegacyChurch.com backslash or forward slash the good book, there will be options for a chronological or a sequential reading plan. So if you go there, um, I think it's on the screen, if you just go there, they can, uh, you can pick which plan you like. Uh, my wife likes the chronological one. She's been reading through that every day, and it just puts it in, in, in you know, the way the stories happen or things happen in the scriptures. And so anyway, let's do that together, can we? I think it'll change your life forever if you can get through the Bible and make it a point. It, it's 10 minutes a day, maybe, maybe 15 at the most, that you can read through it. And, and so we're going to do that as a church as we go through 40 weeks of this series, and we're going to hit 40 major events throughout the scriptures and, apply, and how we apply them to our life, how they're applicable for you and I today as Christians. Because how many of y'all know we live in a chaotic world? Come on, it's just crazy out there. And so how do we make sense of that? We have to begin from the beginning. So Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The four words I want you to look at is in the beginning, God. God. God is the beginning. He's the beginning of all things. There is nothing without him. Little kids have asked me over the years, and, and they said, you know, who made us? God. Well, who made God? There, that's a great question, but the reality is God is God. He, if without him, none of us would be even able to answer that question. But how do we live in this world when it's so crazy. So today, as we start this 40-week series called The Good Book, we're going to look at the big picture of the Bible. What is God trying to tell us? And as we call this series The Good Book, it's not just because of its collection of historical accounts, prophecies, and teachings. No, it's The Good Book because it reveals the heart of God and His blueprint for all of our lives. Also today, we have with us Luis Sanchez. Stand up, Mr. Sanchez, stand up. Um, you say, why am I having him stand up? <laughs> him and his family have been a part of our church for over four years, and now he's running, running for the U.S. United States representative, uh, congressional seat, I think, District 1. And uh, he's running against someone that's so ungodly, it's unbelievable. You know, this, this person that stands very, I think she's connected with AOC, it's part of the squad that doesn't believe in America. They want to kill all the cows, you know. It's just dumb. They're just dumb. But anyway, he's got, he has a table in the foyer. Uh, he just needs signatures. If you, if you would go by the table and, and they can tell you what they need, you can just sign up. He needs, you know, in our state, they need so many signatures to get on the ballot. And so if you go out there and, and then you get to talk to him, ask him what he believes, what he stands for. And if it's someone you can uh, support, then please go sign their petition. That's all we're asking. Listen, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. When we look at the beginning that God, in the beginning God, it begins to tell us a story of who we are. So let's listen to this. Then God said, in verse 26, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. That's the name of the, that's the title. We are made in the image of God. He created us in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God never created one gender. He created two sexes, male and female, period. All the gender stuff is from humanism, it's from secularism, it's from the world, it's from the alphabet mafia. The God never created a gender. He created two sexes, male and female. You say, how do you know? He had just read it. Thus saith God. He created us male and female. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. And notice he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. 
It goes against everything that the world is saying, the craziness that we're overpopulated. There's too many people in the world. Now there's over 8 billion, and they just want to kill them all. they just like, we need to kill some people. We've overpopulated the earth. The reason why they say that is because they worship the creation instead of the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. If there was 20 billion people on the earth, we'd still be good. He said, but pastor, that's a lot of people. Well, God wanted a lot of people. And we don't worship the earth. In our schools, our kids are getting indoctrinated with this craziness of Mother Earth. I want to say it again. My mother's name is Phyllis. I only have one mom. And it ain't this earth. Excuse my English. It's not this earth. This earth is a place, is a tool for us to live in. Yeah, we got to take care of it, but not the way these people want. So God said, not not the world, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, making the sixth day. A passage, or this passage, lays the foundation for everything that follows. Here we discover a truth that can transform how we see ourselves, our world, and even God. We are made in the image of God. That's period, dot. We are all made in his image. And if you don't believe in Genesis 1, 1, Genesis 1 through the first two or three chapters, then your Bible is no good to you. Because if you don't believe the first part, in the beginning God, and God created us, then the rest of it is not even worth reading for yourself. We must, as believers, believe in this in the beginning God, and that God created us male and female. Anything else turns the truth of God into a lie. Anything else does that. God wants us to understand he is our creator, and we're to worship him and him alone. In the beginning God, with these four words, the Bible doesn't just start a story, it introduces the story. A story not confined by time or space, but one that encompasses the entirety of creation, including you and me, including all of us. There's a singular declaration that stands out, and here it is, again, we are made in his image. Folks, it's so important as we read the Bible, as we learn about God, follow Jesus, to understand this. If you believe anything else, then the Bible is just a book You might as well just toss it away or give it away. You have to believe this first part. You have to believe that we're here for a reason. So let me tell you something. This isn't just a nice thought or a poetic way of speaking. This is the bedrock of our identity. In a world that constantly tries to measure our worth by what we have, what we do, or what others think about us. Genesis 1 sends an unmistakable message. You are priceless. Why? Because you bear the image of the creator himself. So there's nothing accidental about you, about your existence. You reflect the divine. That means you're, you're here by, on purpose, for a purpose. I'm gonna say that over and over again today. You're here on purpose, for a purpose. There's no accidents or mistakes in this room. Not one. And people are searching in our culture for identity. You know why? Because they've rejected God himself. They've just rejected God. They've just removed God from their whole lives. They say they believe in God, but you gotta ask the question, I say this quite a bit, ask them what God do you believe in? Because if you believe in God, the Bible, you believe in the beginning God, and you believe that God created male and female. Period. He didn't create anything else. All the gender stuff, all the other stuff is just, is just turning the truth of God into a lie. And as Christians, it doesn't matter who it is in your family, your life, 
You cannot buy into it. You cannot approve of it. You cannot applaud it. You applaud it because in Romans 1 it says, and not only did they practice such things, but those who applaud or those who you know, endorse, they're just as guilty. See, God has a way, and he created us for a reason. No accidents. My mom and dad used to tell me all the time, oh, Steve, you were an accident. Not in a mean way, but they would say it because they said, we didn't plan you. I came four and a half years after the, my brother just older than me, there's five kids. And, and I'm like, well, I, I know what happened because then my brother, my younger brother, Pastor Troy was born 18 months after me. And I said, you practiced the first three times and got it right the next two times. <laughs> my brothers and my, my older brother and sisters, my older, two older brothers and sisters, they used to tell them, you guys, you guys have it made. You guys get treated different than we did. And you know what? I just owned it. Like, thank you very much. I'm so happy. <laughs> but even in their jest, we weren't accidents. There is not an accident here. Your parents may have said you're a mistake, but you're not a mistake. You may have been an accident to them or a mistake to them, but you're not a mistake to God. He created you on purpose for a purpose. That's just the reality of who we are. You're here for a reason, and you're God's greatest creative work. There's nothing greater. In New Mexico, you can see beautiful sunsets. We can look at the mountains, you know, when the clouds come over them and, the, you know, the snow's on them or they, they turn kind of red, and that's why they're called the Sandias. We can look and say they're so majestic and so beautiful. You can look at anything in creation and think that, but there's nothing greater than you sitting in that seat right now or watching online. There's nothing greater. You are God's greatest creative work. Why? Because you bear his image. You're made, we are made in the image of God. Now people wanna put a color on God. Well, he's this color, he's that color. It's just dumb. God is God, he made all the colors. He's all of us. And that's why he probably doesn't get why we separate ourselves by the color of our skin. It's not biblical. God only separated people by whether they were believers or non-believers. He didn't care what color they were. Are you a believer or non-believer? And so God wants us to understand he created all of us on purpose, for a purpose. Nothing accidental about your existence. People said you may be no good, you're stupid, you're dumb. No, nope, I'm made in the image of God. I am somebody. Why? Because God created me. So what does it mean really to be made in God's image? It's more than just a resemblance. It's about representation and relationship. Like a mirror reflecting the sun's rays, we are created to reflect God's character, his love, his justice, his mercy to the world around us. Being in his image means we have the capacity for creativity, for making moral choices, for forming relationships, for experiencing love and sorrow. It means we are wired for connection with him and with one another. That's what it means to be made in his image. We, we have the ability to love and to feel sorrow. We have the ability to create and be creative. We have the ability to build relationships. God created us to have a connection with him and with other people. That's why isolating yourself is not good. That's why we need to continually understand in the beginning God and God created all of us, male and female. Now stepping back, let's Let's consider this big picture, if you would. The Bible from Genesis to Revelations tells a single coherent story. It's the story of God's relentless pursuit of a relationship with you, with us, his creation. He wants a relationship with you. People think, well, I'm just not worth anything. I'm worthless. No, nope, you're not, because you're, you're his greatest creative work. You're made in his image. You're not worthless. The world may tell you you're worthless. People in your life may have told you you're worthless. God has never said that. He said you're worth something. In fact, you're worth so much, he sent his son to die for you. Why would he do that? He didn't send his son to die for any other part of creation, only you. Why? Because you're worth something. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to be a part of your world. But you and I, we have to and want to be a part of his world. 
Through every page, every event, every prophecy, every teaching, we see God's plan unfolding, a plan to redeem and restore all of us. Now, the reason redemption um, happens or when you hear that is because when Adam and Eve were in the garden, Eve was deceived and Adam transgressed. In other words, Eve was deceived by the serpent. She ate of whatever that fruit was. And then Adam just did it. He just chose to do it. And God removed him from the garden, not because he didn't love them or care about them, because he actually loved them. And he said, if you stay in the garden, you'll continue to eat of the tree of life and you'll be separated from me forever. He did not want us separated from him forever. So when it talks about redeem or redemption, it's him redeeming us back to have a relationship with him. And the Bible says in Galatians, we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, which is poverty, sickness, sin, and disease. And we're redeemed from sin so we can have a relationship with him. So he had this plan in motion to redeem all of us. And so the Bible tells this story. And it, and it, it, it began, it, the Bible isn't just a collection of disconnected stories. It's the narrative of God's interaction with humanity culminating in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So where do we fit into God's story? Right at the heart of it. Despite our failures, our doubts, and our struggles, God chose to create us in his image and redeem us through his son. This means our lives have purpose, our actions have significance, and our existence has value beyond measure. We are not here by accident, we are here on purpose, for purpose. There is no accidents, no mistakes, nobody. And people, you know, it's just false humility. You know, people will say things like, you know, I'm just not worth that much. I'm just, God, God's got bigger things to deal with than me. Can I tell you something? That's a false humility. It makes no sense. If there was 20 billion people on the earth and every one of them got born again and started serving God and they all prayed, God can answer all 20 billion prayers like that. So when people, it's this false humility, you know, God's got bigger things, I don't wanna bother him with my stuff. It's like, are you kidding? What are you saying? You're saying God is so small and tiny, he can't handle all of us. In the beginning, God created everything. And his greatest of creations was you and I. He can hear all of our prayers and answer them all at once. He's not, your, your problems aren't too big or too small. You're not bothering God. You're actually doing what he says. Come to him where you can obtain mercy and grace in your time of need. God wants a relationship with you. But so oftentimes we're inundated or indoctrinated or life has thrown us some really bad curveballs, if you would, and, and make us feel less than who we are. Man, we're God's greatest creative work. You are. God did a wonderful thing creating you and I. People matter to God. They're valuable to God. Now, not all people are nice. Not all people are good. Not all people do the right things, but God still loves them. People have said to me over the years when certain bad people, you know, awful people that's done awful things, you'll hear stories that they got born again maybe in prison or something, and people would say, how could God save them? Well, the question is, how could God save you? Because we're saying, well, I didn't do that, but you've done a lot of other things. Sin is sin to God. And every person is redeemable. Why? Because you are made in the image of Christ. You and I are made in his image. So our lives have purpose. Our actions have significance. And our existence has value beyond measure. See, the image of God refers to something that is carved, a statue, or a representation or likeness of God. And you and I are called to be that likeness to this lost and dark world. So let us remember the foundational truth that we've begun to explore today. You are made in the image of God. In a world that often feels chaotic and broken, this truth remains unshaken. Let it anchor each and every one of us. Let it guide you and let it empower you to live out God's purpose for your life. You are not an accident or a mistake. God created you for his purpose. And the bottom line is this. 
If the devil can get you to doubt this first major event, that you are God's most outstanding creative work, made in his image because he loves you and wanted you to be born, then nothing else matters. If the enemy can get you to believe that this is not the way it worked, if he doesn't get you to understand that God's creation is valuable, that's why we shouldn't murder it. That's why you can't believe in abortion. Well, I believe under these. No, that's what the world has told you to believe. What does God say? Well, these circumstances dictate, no. Every child has the ability to be loved. Every person in this room has the ability to be loved. So this is your identity in a world that's where there's an identity crisis. Stop making your own identity. You have one. You are made in his image to serve God by serving others, to do his will, his word. You are somebody. People struggle today with identity. You're seeing it everywhere you hear. This is my identity. This is how I identify. You know why? Because they've rejected God. They've moved away from their creation, so they're lost. And why do we buy into a lost world? It doesn't make any sense. If you're truly born again, you have an identity. Quit looking for it. Now, I've maybe had to look for my purpose, but I always identified since I've been born again with Christ. I've never had a struggle with my identity. I knew I was a, born a man, thank God. <laughs> Made for a woman. And, and this is what I knew. I was a born again believer when I got born again. And what was my, what was my identity in Christ? I'm just, I'm a child of the most high. So, so then people say, well, how do I find my purpose? By doing what you know to do that's written so easily. I didn't know I was going to be a pastor. There's no scripture that says that Steve Smotherman was going to be a pastor. But there are a lot of scriptures that said, Steve Smotherman better go to church. Amen. Steve Smotherman better get involved and serve. Steve Smotherman better give and honor God that way. And you know what? When you, when you do your, what you know to do, that's part of your purpose, then he can direct your path to where you're supposed to be. It doesn't mean outside the church. It doesn't mean you ever quit serving. It doesn't mean you ever quit giving. But at least you have peace that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Whether he's called you to be an architect or an engineer or a lawyer or a, a construction worker or a janitor or a, a truck driver, whatever it is that he's called you to do, he needs people that believe in him and understand we are his greatest creative work in every in every part of the world, in every part of life, so he can, we can reflect his image to them so that they can understand that you are God's creation. See, we, we do it like, well, you're this, so you're really something. And you're this, and you're really something. And I'm just this. No, no, -uh. we're all really something. And whatever he's called you to do, that's his purpose. So why would we ever thumb our nose at that or look down on it? Why? I don't look down on anybody. I'm grateful for the people that clean this place. I'm grateful for the maintenance that keeps this place nice. If you walk in here, it's always clean and nice because I think the house of God should be immaculate. And I appreciate those people that do that. You'll find your purpose by starting to do what God wants you to do right now. And then all of a sudden, he can lead and guide you. I didn't know for the longest time I was a pastor. When I was in Bible school and I went to my second year, you had to pick whether you were apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, or teacher. I had no clue. And a friend of mine, a close friend of mine said to me, I said, I'm not going, I don't know what I am. He said, just go in the teacher's thing. I said, so you think I'm a teacher? And he goes, I don't know, but no matter what you do in the body of Christ, you have to teach. Right. Made sense to me. Because <laughs> I really didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know. I knew who I was, but just maybe not quite what I was supposed to do. There's a big difference. So many people in the church don't know who you are. That's why we're starting right here. Now you know. You're God's greatest creative work. You're here to serve him as you serve others. You're here to walk with him and learn about him and his ways. 
so he can redeem you from all the junk of this world. We don't have to search for an identity. And the people that do have turned the truth of God into a lie. And so I went into the teaching thing and I went through that and then as I you know, went to work at UPS and then I was refereeing all these sports, this friend of mine, his name's Larry King, he, he, he began to, he ministered to people all the time. He flowed similar to San, Sandy in the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and he would just minister to people. We'd be anywhere and people, these grown men would be crying, he'd be praying with them and talking to them. And then we would both know them and he would say, now you just need to get close to Steve. And I'm like, what the heck, man? I didn't do anything. And I said, well, and I asked him one day, why do you keep telling people to talk to me? And he said, because you'll care for them. You'll keep talking to them. You'll keep sharing things with them. You, when they come to you and ask questions, you're, you're willing to answer them. And I said, why don't you do that? And he goes, because that's not who I am. I'm like, what? <laughs> and this is what he said to me. He said, you really don't know, do you? And I said, no. He goes, you're a pastor. I'm like, oh, well, what? I had no idea. But can I say this to you? It wasn't... It wasn't all sparkles and voices that says, this is what you're supposed to do. It was someone looking at me, kind of mocking me and saying, you're, you're just that dumb. You really don't know. And I'm like, no, I, I didn't. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I am a pastor. I didn't even know what that was. I just knew that they preached. I didn't realize there's shepherds who care for people. And I like people. Now, I don't like every person, but I like people. <laughs> I just keep it honest. Come on. Anybody gets up and say, I just love everybody. You lie. You lie. You, you go fry. That's not true. There's some people you just tolerate. Come on. Thank God he never tolerates any of us. He just loves all of us. He has the capacity to do that. And so that's why I went, moved to Roswell. I, I said, well, I guess I'm a pastor. People are waiting for like this big booming voice and this big move of God and this supernatural experience. Mine was, you're kidding, you don't know? You're just that dumb? It's just, come on. You... I'm like, really, I didn't know. But after he said it, it kind of made sense. Like, oh, it just feels right. And, and that's how it works. But how will you ever know if you don't do what you're supposed to do now? You'll be struggling. You'll always be looking for a new thing or a new identity. I'm telling you, folks, if you get this in your heart and mind, you won't have to search for any identity. You'll say, I know who I am. I'm a child of the Most High God, and I'm called to do His will on this earth, and I will just do it. You get involved. You serve. That's why we got, got, get people to get involved, because they're struggling with identity. Once you start serving, you won't wonder what you are. You'll know who you are. That's why the world wonders what a man is or a woman. They can't even answer the question. They're so dumb. I mean, that documentary, the guy did, what, what is a woman? And, and these, these so-called experts and psychologists, they wouldn't answer the question. Actually, he looked at one lady and said, you're a woman? No, I'm not a woman. I don't identify as a woman. Well, I don't care what you identify as. God made you a female. You're not a man trapped anywhere. That's deception, but it's, it's been pervasive. Why? Because the church refuses to address these issues out of fear we're going to lose somebody. But if you identify with Christ, we're not going to lose you. We're going to gain you because now you have truth that you can hang on to and begin to act on and begin to serve God and honor others. How do I serve God? By serving others, by serving his creation. And why wouldn't we want to serve our are the God's greatest creative work, people. So many people spend so many hours of their life taking care of the creation, but not enough taking care of his greatest creative works. People say, I just don't like people. Well, if you're truly born again, you better start liking people because your heavenly father liked you enough to make you create you, put you on this earth, and you're here on purpose for a purpose. You are God's most outstanding creative work, made in his image because he loves you and wanted you to be born. Nothing else matters. So this is your identity. So stop making up your own identity. You have one. You're made in his image to serve God by serving others, 
to do his will, his word, you are somebody. And if you believe you are an accident, then you will have no purpose in life. When you have no purpose, you go through life as a victim of your circumstances. Folks, we can all be victimized in this world. You're not immune to that. None of us are. But just because we're victimized, something happens to us, doesn't mean we have to become a victim. And when you understand who created you, why you're here, you're here on, you were created on purpose for a purpose, you, 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 you're not a victim of your circumstances because we know and believe the Bible. And when this happens, people start to search for meaning and identity wherever they can find it. We trade the truth for a lie. If creation is an accident, then everything is an accident. If creation was an accident, the people that believe that in the theory of evolution, I personally don't believe in the theory of evolution. I believe that God spoke into existence what is here. I believe that with all my heart. And and, and some say, if you believe in the theory of evolution and and that this big, huge cosmos, whatever thing just blew up and these planets exploded and and then all of a sudden everything's perfect. They say it's no different than believing if you and I walked by a junkyard and threw a bomb in it, that out would come a perfectly beautiful running vehicle. I'm serious. That's what you'd have to believe. That out of it would come a car and a chassis and, and shocks and four wheels and, and, and you know, uh, interior that's perfect paint job that's perfect, an engine that's perfectly put together, a transmission, and everything goes with it, so you could just get in and drive off. We all know that's crazy. So I don't believe that. I believe in, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. And then people get caught up with time, and I talk about this some. My son was talking to me about it before, between services, that time, and, and, and people get caught up with the earth is millions of years old. I personally don't believe that. I believe it's 6,000. Why? Because that's what my Bible says. But if you believe in all this time, God made everything in, in adulthood, didn't he? He made everything with age. He didn't put Adam and Eve in the garden as babies. He put them as adults. He can make this earth look as old as he wants it to look. But he made everything in adulthood. He didn't make baby elephants, he made adult elephants. He didn't make baby lions, he made adult lions. Everything he created in creation was in adulthood. Why? So when they procreate and do that, that the, that the ones that, when the lions made it and have lions, the other lions could look and say, that's who I am. So when he made you and I his greatest creative work, He made Adam and Eve in adulthood. So when they had children, those children, because they're reflecting the image of God, they'd look up and say, that's what a man is. And the little girls would say, that's what a woman is. This is how we act. This is how we do things. That's why when God gives you kids, you're supposed to be a reflection of God and train them up in his ways, not the world's ways. And then they should see the reflection of God from you. It doesn't mean you don't correct them or you don't get on them some, because we do, but, but it means that we do it in a, in a way that's kind and loving. We're not screaming meanies all the time and putting them down and calling them dumb and stupid. I mean, I, I think adults talk way too much in front of their kids today. We should protect these babies. We should keep them as innocent as we can for as long as we can. But that's why he made things in adulthood. Go to Romans, if you would, in your Bible, the book of Romans, chapter one, verses 25 through 27. Remember I just said that people turn the truth of God into a lie. They, 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 they've done it so much, and then people start believing the lie. Listen to what the Bible says. Not Steve, the B-I-B-L-E. They traded the truth about God for a lie. This is what happened when they did that. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise, amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. This is what's happened in our country today. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal you hear that word normal? 
normal sexual relationships with women burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserve. Think about this. Think about what I'm saying. So the byproduct of not worshiping the creator, but worshiping the creation has created the mess we're in today in America. That's why we're losing our kids, because you don't keep your kids in church. Church is optional, but sports and everything is so important. And 99% of them aren't gonna play past high school. And I don't want my kids or my grandkids' best years to be in high school. I want their best years to be the next year and the next year and the next year. So many people still live, and I see, I, I get around men, and they're still talking about their glory days in high school. When I was in high school, I could do this and that and that. I said, yeah, but you're not in high school now. What are you doing now? And they keep living there. But when we worship the creation, that's why environmentalists, think about it, folks. It's their religion. It's their faith. That's why they're so crazy about it and, the, and passionate and compassionate. I mean, they're just passionate about it. And yet we're not as passionate about worshiping the creator that we listen to this junk. That somehow my carbon footprint is ruining the earth or your carbon footprint or there's too many people. That's what the news and the media says all the time. It's a lie. God said be fruitful and multiply. He made this earth big enough for 20 billion of us if that was the case. Well, there's eight billion, it's too many. It's not enough. If it was, God would have put a limit and said, be fruitful and multiply until you get to this, you know, this many, and then stop. He didn't tell us to stop. It's eternal. It's forever. Forever. That's why we've got to be careful buying into all the rhetoric of the alphabet mafia. People will say, well, I'm straight. I'm, I'm glad. I'm normal. <laughs> I don't know. Stand, stand straight. Okay. This is dumb. Well, they're gay. No, they're not. They're not happy. <laughs> See, we get caught up in all that. You know, and the big catchphrase is bullying. Everybody's a bully. I, 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 you know, we deal with parents all the time, and, and it's so amazing to me. This kid said he didn't like my daughter or my son. They're a bully. I'm like, that's not a bully. They just don't like them. And sometimes you don't like them, so what's the point? Everything's bullying. You know why? Because there's too many victims. When I was a kid, you know, I was born with a crossed eye. So my crossed eye, it would just sit on the, the it would sit right here on the, uh, and, and the corner of my eye. And, and when I would look at you, you'd be, you'd be like, who, who are you looking at? <laughs> and I'd say, I don't know, because there's two of you. So I had double vision and I was cross-eyed. And kids used to call me cross-eyed. You cross-eyed. You four eyes, and, and literally, if my dad was still alive, he'd tell you, I would just punch them. <laughs> I lost a few fights, but I won a few. You say, why'd you punch them? Because they were making fun of me, and I couldn't take it. My own dad, who was a fighter, who fought all the time, is an adult in bars. He would say, Steve, you got to quit fighting. I said, Dad, they're calling me names, four eyes and cross-eyed. I can't take it. And so I would fight. And, 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 and some people say, that, oh, you are so bullied. Oh, get real. I was, it was just a bunch of kids, a bunch of dumb stuff. I never saw myself as being bullied. Amen. In fact, back in the day, you had bullies. And they would, they would try to kick your butt some. I remember I'd go home and say, Dad, this kid's picking on me. He'd say, go fight him. I'm like, what? <laughs> He'd say, go fight him. He said, even if you lose, they'll, they'll, they'll quit messing with you. They'll go find an easier target. And so you'd go up to him and you'd fight him. And then sometimes you'd find out the bully wasn't that tough. And then after you won, you're like, what, what? <laughs> but see, we all get caught up in that. I'm being bullied at work. I'm being bullied. At... Can it... Why do we use that terminology all the time? All it does is say, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. And you say, well, what if you are getting bullied? Then deal with it. But not everybody just, everything said to you is not being bullied. I don't like you. I think you're ugly. I think you're whatever. That's not being bullied. That's just someone's opinion. But everything today is bullying. Why? Because the world has done a good job indoctrinating us. We got to teach our kids to be tougher skin than that. Why? Because they're created in the image of God. And, and, and the devil constantly wants to get your goat, doesn't he? 
I had to grow out of that. And now if you said, hey, if I, my eye went in and you said cross eyed, I'd just laugh, whatever. It is what it is. I didn't make me, God did. Well, God, why did God make you cross eyed? I don't know. I don't think he did. I think it was just part of this world, this fallen world we live in. None of my brothers and sisters had that issue. My sister, mother, three brothers, nobody had any issues. But they'd have to work me. I had a ball, I had to wear a patch, I had to do the th I had to do all these exercises constantly, try to get my eye moving so my brain would recognize it, because it wouldn't recognize it. And then one day I'm, my parents bought me a brand new pair of sunglasses. I mean glasses. We were living in Tehran, Iran. And they, they bought me, it was brand new, the first day I wore them. And I said something to a girl, I'll never forget. I don't know what I said to her. I don't remember her name. I said something to this girl, she slapped me. I was a sixth grader. I could have went home and said, mommy, like some guy, mommy, that girl's bullying me. Like, my dad would have been like, what? What did you just say? But she slapped me and all I could see is my glasses going. Tuh, tuh, tuh. And then they landed right and it just cracked it. And I was terrified, like, I gotta go home and I just bought these. And I'm looking at her like, what? And, and I probably deserved it. But anyway, I went home and I showed my parents and my mom and dad were mad. They said, we just bought you those glasses. The next thing I know, I'm going to Germany to get an eye operation. God used that so I wouldn't have to deal with that any longer. I wasn't born again. My mom was. God was taking care of me even when I didn't even recognize him. Can I say this to you? God takes care of you even when you don't recognize it. Even when you don't, God is for you. Why? Because you're not an accident. You're here on purpose for, for purpose. So we see this when we look at the world we live in. People have either forgotten or don't know these two essential truths from Genesis 1. You are no accident. And God created you on purpose for a purpose. And when you learn this, you realize that this will, you'll no longer be a victim. See, everything that happens to us, God turns around for our good and his glory. You're part of God's plan. What does Romans 8, 28 says? And we know. We don't wonder. We don't think about it. We know all things work together for, for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things. So... You know, we grew up in a military home. We moved every two to three years back then. Today, they don't move as much. And it served me well because I got around every kind of people. God knew what I was called to do long before I even knew I was even believed in him. So he, he put us from place to place. And so I learned to make friends wherever I went. And you know why? Because God, God knew when I got older, he was going to have to move me some. And some people were so opposed to it. Me, I was like, it's just what I've done all my life. And I can come in and get to know people. Why? Because we value people and I value people. God knew what he was doing. So you can look at your whole life and think it was bad and awful and horrific. And some of your stories could be, and you know, mine's not even that bad. But some of you have horrific stories that break my heart when I hear them. But here's what you need to understand. You are God's greatest creative work. He created you on purpose for a purpose. And even though that is so bad, if we believe in him, we know all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Maybe he needed you to have compassion on somebody else. It's the people who think they're perfect that are the hard, worst people to be around because all they do is point fingers. They've never had hurt or pain. And it's tragic, and I see it all the time. I hear it. I don't know why people do this. Because they're hurting. And it teaches us compassion. For what? God's greatest creative work, which is not the earth, it's not the mountains, it's not the sunsets, it's not the rainbows and unicorns. It's you. You need to look at yourself today in the mirror tomorrow and say, God created me in his image. I will reflect that image wherever I go. And when I blow it, he is gracious enough to forgive me. Your identity and purpose are found only in him. Psalms 14, one says, only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. And isn't it funny, we say to people today, well, they're, they're ungodly, they don't believe in God, but they're good people. 
And my Bible just said, God said none of them are good. None of them. None of them. Isn't it funny how we talk today? Well, they're good people, so surely they got to go to heaven. And you know what's interesting? Jesus even said it again. He said in Matthew, when the rich young ruler came to him and said, good master, he stopped the whole conversation and said, hey, 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 there's none good but one God. Don't call me good. And isn't it funny he speaks to that directly and in our society today, what do people say all the time? They're good people. They're good people. Surely God loves them. God loves everybody. But surely they'll get to go to heaven because they're good people. That's, that's a lie. Quit turning the truth of God into a lie. None of us can be good enough for the creator. He has to make us good enough by us accepting Jesus into our lives. That's the only way you become good enough for God. And we're not good, he's good. We're just a work in progress. But you should never struggle with your identity after this. Maybe your purpose a little bit, but the reason so many of us in the Christianity struggle with their purpose is because they're unwilling to do the simplicity that God's already given. And God doesn't give you the next step until you've done the first step. Well, I, I believe in God, but I don't want to go to church. Then you, you probably never find your purpose. You, you'll find a career maybe, but you won't find your purpose. Well, I believe in God. I don't need to serve. Yes, you do. I don't need to do this. Yes, you do. I don't need to do. Yes, you got to do what the Bible says. And because someone, God put me under someone that cared enough about me, say, Steve, you got to get involved. You got to serve. You got to start giving. I just start doing what they said. And I never struggled with my identity. Not one time have I ever looked and said, God, I don't know why, who, you know, who I am. I, I knew I was a child of God. I may have not known all the time what I was supposed to do, but the reason a lot of us will never find that, because we're unwilling to do what he's already asked you to do. And God is not like the Albuquerque school system. If you don't finish first grade, you stay in first grade. If you don't pass it, you stay. In the system, you can flunk out, not even go to school and be put to the next grade because they don't want to bother with you. God likes bothering with you. Why? Because of everything he created on this earth, there's nothing better than you, you and I. People are his greatest creative works. And the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelations is the story of how he relentlessly pursues us so that we would have a relationship with him. You're created for purpose, on purpose. No accidents in this room. No accidents online. We're created in the image of God. Wow. Thank God. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for teaching us today. I thank you for being here. Thank you for helping us all to understand what, what you're saying. It's not so important what I say that counts. It's what you say to each individual about what's said that matters the most because we're all in different places. <coughs> but Father, I pray this will help all of us. It helped me when I was studying it out and put it together. Just to remind me that, man, I'm made in the image of God. Let me reflect his nature to others. Help me not to be harsh, or, but help me to stand. Thank you, Father, that will reflect your image onto this lost world and this dark world and to bring light to their souls and help to their hearts and minds and their lives. Thank you, Father, for creating all of us. You put us here on purpose, for a purpose, each and every one. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. If you're here with every head bowed, you say, Preacher, would you pray with me? I walk with God, but I walked away. Would you pray with me to get right with him today? Would you pray with me? I want to come home. You're right. I need to identify with Christ because that's my identity. I need to get it right. I need to quit walking away and doing my own thing. I'm going to do God's thing. Would you pray with me to come home? Get it right. Or if you're here and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I've never truly asked Jesus to be Lord of my life. So many people want salvation, but salvation is a byproduct of lordship. If you believe in your heart and confess through the mouth the lordship of Jesus, in other words, you give him permission to lead and guide your life, and you're saying, I will purpose to follow you. You won't always get it right. You won't always make the right decisions. You won't always do everything right, but you still purpose to follow him. That's all he's asking. 
If you're willing to do that, then he'll save you. I believe salvation is a byproduct of lordship, that you believe that he's Lord and, and ask him to be Lord of your life, and then he saves you from sin and eternal death and hell. So if that's you with every head bowed just for the next moment, if you just bow your heads just for a moment, just in respect and say, preacher, that's me. Would you pray for me? God, I'm ready. I'm ready. In Jesus' name, if that's you, right where you're seated all over this place without any hesitation, would you do me this honor? Right where you're seated. If you say, would you please include me in your prayer today, preacher? Would you just lift your hand all over this place? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. 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 God bless you over here. Thank you. God bless you up there. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you over there. Yep. Anybody else as I look across the church? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I'm just looking across the church. Thank you. Who else? I'm going to look across the top section one more time. Thank you over here. Thank you, sir, in the bottom section. Thank you. God bless you. God cares. You might as well come and meet your creator. He made you. No one else made you. And he created you. And you're not an accident or mistake. You're not worth less. You're worth, you're valuable. You're worth something great. Anybody else before we close say, okay, I want to meet my creator. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. I see. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just looking across one more time. Anybody else? Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You saw these folks lift their hand to you. They're confessing you before man, and now you're confessing them before our Heavenly Father. They're willing to acknowledge you, and who cares what anybody else thinks? So I pray blessings upon them. I pray, God, as we come home to our Creator, or as we get to know our Creator, that, God, you will minister to hearts and minds and let them know how valuable they are to you, how much you care and love them. In Jesus' name. If you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer aloud to me right where you're seated, loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. I want everybody in here, if you would, to pray with us. This is how you serve others, by supporting those that lifted their hand and praying. We're all going to pray together. And maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you know you should have. I'm going to lead you to Jesus because he's the only Savior of the world. There is no other redemption outside of Jesus. Would you pray this with me, church? Would you pray, God? I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he is the son of God. He's the only way. And you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. So with my heart, I believe that. And with my mouth, I willingly confess, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I believe. Thank you for creating me for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord.